Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming for this talk. I'm Kai, and currently a PhD candidate at Tsinghua University, and I'll be visiting Yale for eight months. Uh, our team has been working work, uh, using Open Daylight for more than a year. Today, I'm going to talk about FAST, which is a project aimed to simplify the current programming framework of Open Daylight. We hope that this project can not, can not only be useful for beginners, but also for experts as well. First, uh, sorry. First, I'll walk through, walk through a few slides this demonstrating how to write a simple open daylight program. For example, here is a program to find the path with the maximum available bandwidth, which can at least satisfy the basic requirement. Uh, we change some syntax to help the code fit in the page. Uh, let's say we have successfully implemented our algorithm and everything looks good and you might think that it should work with open daylight. Unfortunately, we can still run in troubles. The first thing we need to worry about is the data con consistency. Uh, as we know, one of the features that SDN has enabled is that the network can be highly dynamic and the controller should be, should be able to respond to all these data changes in the network. And uh, when something changes in the network, for example, the topologies, statistics, and maybe user policies, it is important that the output of this program can be consistent with all the uh, input data. And we use different colors to mark the input data and the output of this program. And the red represents input data, which includes uh, the functions itself and also the parameters and also the data that read from the uh, data store. And we, or in a more general term, the information sources. And the output is basically the data that is written to a CS store. And also we name that information sync. Okay, so the next step is that we register all these uh, data change listeners to the input so that we can be notified when the data change happens. Uh, we, we also have to implement this on data change uh, listener class. Uh, which basically, of course, the first, the most, the simplest way to restore the state is by uh, execute the program again with the current status. But you can have, but the previous uh, step, one, one key step we're missing is that we have to also clean up the side effects. For example, uh, if the program has installed some floor rules on the switches. If we don't remove them and just install the new rules, some old rule may still uh, may still in a switch and can, they can cause some uh, unwanted behaviors. The uh, now, after we finish all the data registration and also the data change listeners, we are able to obtain the data consistency for our program. Now we try to uh, improve its performance because uh, in the, when we are listening to the data changes, we register for the more coarse-grained data dependency, which we identified when we, ask, when we start to write the program. But during the execution, in the program uh, does not necessarily touch all of the data in the data tree. And what we try to do is, we want, uh, in that case, the data, some of the notifications may be false positive. So they, they don't actually affect the result of your program but you still have to execute your program and clean up the side effects to, uh, make, to maintain the data consistency. And one more step to solve this problem is to add this a, a verifier, which can filter out some irrelevant events that may not affect the results of your program. Another approach is to just monitor those that are really uh, can affect the output of your program. In this case, for example, we have all these touch functions so that you can mark what data is touched and only, uh, only these touched data that can, for example, if you have this uh, execution trace and you have these if conditions, jump conditions, only these data that are affected these conditions and also, right to the, uh, also related to the output uh, values that can affect the output of this program, so we only need to monitor these. But the problem, and, and also we can push to the extent that we, 
we, for example, a link, it can have many attributes, not the bandwidth, and also, for example, its type, and maybe some, ad, for example, the packets, number of nodes, and we don't necessarily need all these data changes. We only monitor what is touched in this program. For example, in this case, the bandwidth. Now, after all these changes, we start with the very first basic program, which is corrected in logic, but does not satisfy the data con consistency. Uh, now, we, the next step is we use, uh, data, we register for data changes, and we use the data change listeners to clean out side effects, and also re-execute the program again to get the latest output. We can obtain a correct program which, uh, with restoration. And then we try to reduce the redundant, re redundant notifications with filters and also accurate dependency tracking. But with all these benefits, the cost is that the program becomes more complex. And we want to ask the question is, can we just write a program which both correct, which means it is, state, it is consistent with the current state, and also efficient that it, it can uh, reduce the redundant re-executions. So let's go back to where we start. Here is when we start write the program, everything just looks more simple. And we have these red to in include the inputs and the blue to represent output. And here's what we have after we add all these features to make it consistent and also efficient. So the motivation of our project is that all the cross codes, can we just automatically generate them instead of have the programmers to write them? And our answer is yes. And the green spot uh, represents the ultimate goal that we try to achieve, that we can simplify, uh, we, we can have the users write a relatively simple program, but we can still achieve relatively good, uh, good performance. And here, it, this, this page gives an overview of the user's view of our FAST system. Uh, we have a concept called launcher program where basically the, where the users, they uh, in, instantiate their function instances and with different, for example, they have these functions, which is basically Java classes, and we use, they, use, they set the parameters to uh, instantiate the classes and submit these classes to our FAST system. And within the uh, classes where the con where the control logic uh, uh, the program has they can read and also write the data from the data with the data store using uh, our fast API which is basically uh, almost the same as uh, uh, open data API you have we have the read operations uh, put merge these operations and we also have some attributes that the launcher program can specify to, uh, to determine the workflows and also to uh, define the, some of the behaviors of these functions. And here we give some examples why we need these attributes. Uh, this page demonstrates, uh, for example, we have three function instances. And the first one transforms the physical topology into a virtual topology. And the second one calculates a path in the virtual topology. And the third one, it maps the calculated path from the virtual topology to the physical topology and install the cor corresponding flow rules. These three functions, they have, uh, uh, they must be executed in sequential order. So we, we must have generated the virtual topology before we can start to calculate the virtual path. So in that case, we need this precedence relation between different function instances to um, basically to give this sequential order that the function instances should be executed in uh, follow, following this order. And this page demonstrates uh, a concept called grouping. So this concept is basically motivated by the uh, wide usage of intents. So for each intent, it can be uh, compiled to some other intents and all these intents must be installed together. You cannot just install 
uh, one intent and just ignore the other. For example, in this example, we have an intent to connect two end hosts. And to connect and two end hosts, we have to set up two flow rules. First is to connect, uh, is to set up the forwarding rule from host one to host two, and the, the other is to set the flow rules from host two to host one. So these two flow rules are basically the path. Maybe it contains many flow rules. So uh, these two paths, they cannot be installed as one. Because you cannot install one path and ignore the other. Then the, the, two, hosts, the two hosts cannot speak to each other. So we have to install them all together uh, in a single transaction. And after the introduction to our API and the user's view of the system, now we have a closer look under the hood and see how this system works. Uh, here is a finished state machine for the function instances. We start with, uh, when the function instance is first uh, submitted to the system, it is in a state of unexecuted. And we will uh, use the scheduler to find the, correspond, uh, the correct order because we have all these uh, groups, precedences, we must respect these rules. So we, the scheduler makes sure that all these in instances are executed in the correct order. And then after uh, the instance is executed, it will, becomes, it will become to a state of self-executed. This state is a state for those that we have, for example, we have this group, and some function instances in this group are already executed, and their data changes are already applied, but not to the data store, but to this, we call it a group cache, which is basically a cache layer of the data store. So when all the function instances in this group are all executed, which means they are all in the self-executed state. We then commit them together in a single transaction to the open data data store. And all the function instances in this group will become executed. And the two states in, the, in blue basically means we also, uh, for example, since we are doing the networking, we not only uh, consider the programs in the control plane, we also have to monitor the state of the data plane. And if, for example, if I try to install a rule, but it fails, then we cannot, in the control plane, say, yeah, you are still executed. We have to uh, do something about this and make sure the data plane is also consistent with the control plane. And here we give an overview of the components of our system. And we will go to some details in the some, in, uh, following slides. Uh, let's look again at this program. We have, uh, we use automatic we, we automatically track the dependencies. We, we automatically track the dependencies by identifying all these dependencies uh, automatically and also uh, register the data change listeners and generate corresponding uh, on data, uh, data change handler. And also, we, are, we can automatically uh, create the binding of your program and your output and restore them correct, uh, to, so that they can be uh, start clean. Okay, uh, so here's the page to demonstrate how we do this automatic data de dependency tracking. So to do automatic data dependency tracking, we need to uh, capture all the data access and also learn the relationship between the function instances and the data. And this cannot be done using the current Open Daylight uh, Data Transaction API. So uh, in fast, we wrap this we wrapped the, the Open Daylight Data Store API using a shim layer so that we can capture the, the, you, the context of this program, which basically is which function instance is uh, accessing the data and what data is being accessed. After we generate all these uh, relationships, we, are able to, we, we can just create the uh, we will register the data change listeners, and we also create a, a data, uh, data change handler to, make to roll back all the data changes and also to re-execute the program automatically. And uh, there are a few challenges we, we, uh, we met when we are developing this system. Basically, uh, as someone, someone may know that OpenData has this um, binding aware 
data, access, uh, data access API, you can read an object out of the data store and you can access the subtrees in using object methods. And we use a Java proxy with this binding aware and binding independent codec to capture these changes and uh, automatically gener uh, ca ca um, find which uh, fun instance identifier you are actually used in your program. And we also do automatic restoration. To do automatic restoration, we need to clear all the side effects of the program. And basically, uh, we need to keep track of what data is af can affect what kind of function instances. And since different function instances may have some relationships, for example, the output of one instance can be the input of another instance. And when we do restoration, we still follow this order and to clean them, uh, to make sure that they can be, after we clean up all the dirty instances, the system state is clean and consistent. Uh, now we also, uh, as I said before, we have the precedence relationships and also grouping relationship. So we have to, we use this scheduler to effectively calculate the execution order of all these function instances. Basically, first we need to respect the precedence order and second, we, uh, since the group will be executed, will be committed together and if we split the function instances in a group uh, to in, um, we intersect them together, it can cause some trouble because when you try to commit, you, you realize that some of the dependencies has already changed, so you have to re-execute them again. And to avoid that, we try to put all the function instances together where the groups can be committed um, in a, uh, more smoothly. So here's a picture of what we, try, what we plan to do in the, in the future works. Um, basically, we have three uh, targets. First is that we want to try, uh, use our framework to resolve some of the conflicts. For example, uh, in Open Data, we have this only one topology, which is named OpenFlow1. And all the applications can access this, top, this, access this data model and write flow rules to this data model. And all these applications, they don't know about each other, so it can cause some kind of conflicts. And we want, if we can capture the relation, that the function instance is updating the um, data model, we can use an aggregator. We, we separate all these uh, applications apart, so if they, uh, in their program, it seems that they are still writing the OpenFlow 1 topology, but we can redirect their output to another position. And we monitor these positions, uh, the flow rules written to this, uh, in, in this uh, kind of virtual topology. And we aggregate all these updates together to try to resolve the conflicts and uh, update the status of corresponding function instances. And we also want to uh, enable the accountability of data. Uh, for example, we have this data dependency graph. We know that what kind of data is read by a function instance and what its output. So we can build uh, the, we, we can understand the relationship between function instances. For example, if a function instance depends on the output of another function instance, we can know that if one, ins one function instance goes wrong, we can track down its data provenance or, uh, tree to find the origin of the problem. And finally, we have this, uh, we, we made it possible that using uh, data re redirections and also isolation so that we can duplicate the control plane and develop new programs and just debug them with, on this uh, isolated control plane. And we can see what kind of changes it may cause to the control plane without actually affecting the network. And next, uh, my colleague Chao will give uh, us a demonstration and some introduction to our current work.
Okay, all right. Uh, thanks, Kai, for the introduction. So after Kai gave you a basic idea about how fast a system works, and uh, I'm going to be giving a very quick uh, introduction about how we develop fast applications for, or say, uh, function instance. So one often is that we uh, just write a prepare a Maven archetype so that uh, we can create a fast app project uh, in open daylight and just uh, do the regular things. And uh, the second option we, our team recently has been uh, working on is a customized browser-based IDE. Uh, we, have a ID, uh, we have a tutorial uh, on, Wednesday, uh, on, on Monday, uh, and uh, here's a wiki page, and you're all welcome to check. And uh, we, on the web page, we provide a uh, uh, virtual, virtual machine image for our IDE. You can, uh, we can always try and to go through several applications uh, we read. Uh, we wrote, <coughs> excuse me. And uh, here's uh, like some uh, screenshot about uh, uh, what we can do in uh, what, what what we can do using this IDE for fast and also maybe another project we'll be working on. And uh, the examples I'm going to show you uh, do the demonstration now. Next is a very simple host-to-host -host <coughs> intent application. And this uh, this intent application basically try to uh, find the path and create a path between two end hosts in the network. And the basic logic for this application is to first to check whether both end hosts are within a host table which uh, stores the, the which stores the hosts that are allowed to communicate, uh, are allowed to have uh, communicate through the network. And if they're if they are both in the host table and the, the uh, application will try to find the shortest path in the in the topology and install the follow rules. So the topology we use uh, is a very simple uh, four-switch topology. We have host H1 here, and we have uh, four-switch S1, S2, S3, and S4, and we have uh, another three hosts on the other side. So the example I'm going to show is we want to, uh, the, uh, we, we wrote the application to submit an intent request to connect uh, H host, uh, and host H1 and, and the host H2. So to do that, uh, so let me install the application first. And in the meantime, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, in the meantime, I want to emphasize that uh, writing a fast application is pretty very simple because uh, this script actually, this is the, the real code for for these applications. In total, all, all the users need, all the developers need to do is just write about approximately 50 lines of code. And uh, so let's see. Now let's uh, suppose, because uh, remember this topology and uh, uh, we already submit the, we already submitted the intent, which can be shown in here. Let's see, uh, like, like, like the, we, we have a log showing, okay, we already submit an intent functions to connect, to request a connection between H1 and H2. But when we do the, in the mini net on the, of the topology, we can try to let H1 ping H2, and we see here nothing happens. So basically all the packets are lost. This is because when we boot up the systems, there's a no entry in the host table. And uh, we'll now look at uh, uh, what will what will happens when we submit in, enter, uh, enter insert two entries in the host table. For using this uh, simple topology, let me using uh, the deluxe to submit one. So the uh, the first one we have is uh, host one, which has a one the uh, IP address ten point zero point zero one, and with the uh, connect uh, switch port uh, open flow one one, and I'll just uh, submit that. And similarly, I will, because host to host requires a two hosts, right? So we have to submit another, insert another one, the H2's IP address and the uh, connector uh, TPID into the host table. So in this way, we will see that uh, there are actually two possible paths between H1 and H2. One is going to this one, and one is going to this one. And uh, let's see what will our application do that. Uh, let me show you, try to, for example, let me dump the flow of the first switch. You see here, uh, uh, yes, uh, forgive me to not mention that there are, when we start a mini net, there are two default rules that will pump every package back to the controller. Those are the pre-installed rules. And uh, the rules, two rules are, uh, on the first, on the first two lines are the rules uh, 
installed by our uh, by automatic re execution of our intent application, because by now uh, fa fa our fast automatically dependent tracking system uh, component will has tracked down that there's a change in the host table, so it will automatically re execute the host uh, host to host intent application. So now if we let H1 and H2 uh, let H1 to ping H2, we'll see that it gets through. So all I need, all, all so from the users view, all the all the user need to do is to just update the host table, which is uh, usually the job for the administrators. So it, and it's quite quite simple. And if and other than the first the part of the, the the flow table of the first switch, let's look at what in the other three. So in the switch two, we see that other than the two default rules, there uh, there's only one rule installed, which forwards the pa uh, traffic from uh, host one to host two. And if we look at the topology here, we see that S two is used only to forward traffic from host one to H two. Uh, and uh, now let's look at uh, what happens in three, switch three here. And we see that switch three has is used for to try to forward traffic back from host one host two back to host one, so we, which means for this intent the communication between two hosts does not use uh, does not use the same path. They use one path for for one direction and the other path for the other for the, for the other direction direction. Sorry. Okay. And now let's see what if I broke down a link. For example, I broke down the link between switch one and the switch two. Oh, S1, not SI. Yeah, and if you look at the back the topology, bring down uh, these two link, this one link. If there, because when we write the application, we do not register any data change listener. Uh, the user does not have uh, register any data, data change listener. So uh, if we just uh, use submit of application such like that it's directly into ODL, bring down this link would does not nothing. You basically just bring down the whole connection because the the the, the rules uh, the the path is just broken. But let's try to you let H1 ping H2 again. And we see that the, the traffic still gets through. That is because fast capture this the, the state change and in the topology, aka, uh, uh, AKA the link down between S switch one and S two, and it will automatically recompute the shortest path be from H one and H two, and try to recompose, rec try to reinstall the path, uh, try to re re reinstall the path for the whole intent between H one and H two. So if we look at the flow table on S1, we see that there are still four rules because uh, there are two rules to direct, uh, to forward pa uh, packets from uh, H1 and from H2. And if we now look at the switch two, because we remember we've already break down the link from S1 to S2. So when we dump the flow rules in switch two, we see that there are only two default rules left here. That, that is because fast automatically reverse or say roll back the flow rules written into the data plane. And if we look at the flow rules in S switch three, we see that compared with the, uh, at the one the, uh, at the beginning where we only ha we have only one rule to forward the traffic, and now switch three actually installed two rules to forward, to forward the packet through between two end hosts. So I hope by now, I, th I know I'm running out of time, so I hope by now we demonstrate how simple and powerful uh, fast is, and especially how simple one user wants to write uh, applications, uh, control plane applications to manage uh, the network traffic and policy. And we are happy to take any questions offline. Thank you.